what miracle were they looking for? They saw dangerous dimensions of God. But at the slightest opportunity, they bowed to bow. They committed adultery with Ashtaroth. There are things you will never learn until you stay with a roommate. For instance, if God wants to teach you long suffering, long suffering, He will give you a roommate that does not that does not have sense. You will be the one to cook. He will be the one to finish the food. Then when he finishes eating the food, he will now make sure you are not angry. If you are angry, we beat you. So. There are things, there are educations, there are experiences you will get by just going through school. So there's exposure. Environment also affects your exposure. That affects your exposure. For instance, i give you a classic example. When I was about to enter university and I decided to come to Delta State University, the way I was shocked being in the world, coming from Lagos as a teenager in Lagos, the way we catch fun in Lagos is meet a teenage girl, ask her out, take her somewhere to a fast food, buy her donuts, buy her croissants, tell her her nose is, nose is pointed, just smile, have fun. Then I, I was shocked. I came to pre-degree in Delta State University, and they said, let's have fun. So me, I was thinking, we'll go to girls' hostel, look for a fine young lady, and then just take her out. And They said, you should go and drink beer. I was shocked. That's so we'll just sit down and be drinking beer, drinking beer, drinking beer, drinking beer, and then we're having fun. It looked to me like suffering. But you see, environment has a way of creating education, exposure. So the level of exposure that a man has, according to the world, also makes him a real man. Are we together? But what does a real man look like based on scripture? So let's look at the Bible. Now let's begin with Songs of Solomon chapter 9, chapter 5, verse 9 to 16. Let me first of all show you how the Shulamite described her beloved. Now what is your beloved more than another beloved? O fairest amongst women. What is your beloved more than another beloved that you so charge us? What was she charging them? Maybe we should begin at the... Maybe, maybe we should start at verse 1. Go to verse 1. Verse 1. Uh, verse 2. Verse 3. Verse 4. Verse 5. Verse 6. Aha. Remember, if you know this story, her beloved came knocking on the door, but she said she had already put off her robe and she didn't want to come out of the bed. By the time she made up her mind to come out of the bed, her beloved that was knocking at the door had already gone. So she said, I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and was gone. My heart leaped when he spoke. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. Verse 7. The watchmen who went about the city found me. They struck me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took my veil away from me. Verse 8. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him I am what? So she was looking for her beloved. It's on the basis of that that in verse 9, the daughters of Jerusalem were now saying, what makes your beloved so special amongst other beloveds? Why is he so special? Why is he so special that you are telling us, if you, if you find my beloved, help me tell him that I'm lovesick. Basically, they were asking, why do you want us to help you look for this man that you are in love with? She now began to tell them a story. Verse 10. My beloved is white and ruddy, chief among how many? 10,000. Next verse. His head is like the finest gold. His locks are wavy and black as a what? Raven. Twelve. His eyes are like doves by the rivers of water, washed with milk and fitly set. He doesn't have half past four. Are you with me? Next verse. His cheeks, Melovanama, are like a bed of spices 
banks of scented herbs. His lips are like lilies, dripping liquid mire. 14. His hands are rods of gold set with beryl. His body is carved ivory inlaid with what? So even these songs of Solomon woman, her emphasis was on what? The looks of the man. There's nothing spiritual she has said about him. She didn't speak about his prayer life. She didn't speak about his love for God. She didn't speak about anything. It was just his physical looks. First thing I need to say to you, there is nothing wrong with your looks or working on your looks as a Christian brother. There is nothing wrong with getting an education. There is nothing wrong with seeking exposure. There is nothing wrong in working on the areas that the world considers as the measurement of true masculinity. But the first thing that sets apart a godly man from a man in the world is that you are pursuing godliness, but you are still giving time to these areas of your life. Did you hear what I said? Let me read it to you how I wrote it. A godly man pursues godliness while still retaining masculinity. That's a godly man. He pursues godliness, but he retains his masculinity. His masculinity in his looks. Not all of us are going to be bodybuilders, but at least you should pay attention to the way you look. And I've said to you before, I think it was in the last um, brothers meeting that we had, things like beauty, things like handsomeness are relative. Have you heard me say that before? What do I mean by they are relative? Have you ever heard the phrase, beauty is in the eye of the beholder? They are relative in the sense that, how do you measure, measure handsome? They are immeasurable. What is the indices for handsome? What is the indices for beauty? How do you know that one person is more beautiful than the other? How do you know that one person is more handsome than the other? What the world tries to do is give you an image of what they consider handsome. And what Christians try to do is try to measure up and meet that image. Are you with me? Even among sisters, there's an image that has been generated by the world, especially the West, that if you claim to be a woman, this is the way you should look. So even brothers, when they are thinking about a woman to marry, they have an image in their mind of what a beautiful woman should look like. So when they are doing advert for um, shampoo, have you ever, have you noticed that there are certain kinds of women that they pick? Are you with me? It's programming to give you the impression that this is what beauty is. This is what a handsome man is. So if you don't look like this, you are not handsome. If you don't look like this, you are not beautiful. So everybody is in a rat race to look like an image that is not the Bible. Are you here? So you are not going to be more handsome or the definition of handsome is not what the world has made it. The definition of handsome is based on two things. How you see yourself and the person that is coming into your life, how they see you, is relative. For instance, what I will consider beautiful might not be what you will consider beautiful. And if not that we are in RCN, I would have done an experiment now. Eh? If this was a normal, maybe class, I'm doing motivational talk somewhere, I would have done that experiment. I can bring three sisters here now. Hmm? And bring seven brothers. I assure you, each of those seven brothers will have different opinions about 
those three sisters. And each of those three sisters, we have different opinions about those seven brothers. Are you with me? So beauty is relative. Handsomeness is relative. Looks are relative. Have you ever had this experience that you went to a wedding? Huh? You went to a wedding. Then you looked at the sister. And then looked at the brother. And you say, ah. Na night, nine the guy take toast down na night. I know you've never had that experience. We are too holy to think those kind of things. But have you ever had that kind of experience? It's not you the person is marrying. Are you with me? The person that is getting married has looked at that person and to them, his hands are like rods of gold. His head. What? I like the head one. Show me the head. The head is which verse? Huh? The head is which verse? Oh. His head is like the finest gold. His head, oh, head. So it is relative. You cannot, you cannot now begin to beat yourself over something, especially you didn't have control over it. You didn't make yourself. Are you with me? So there's going to be someone that is going to come into your space that will recognize that you are like the finest gold. Because beauty and handsomeness is relative. So my next scripture, give me um, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Let's begin at verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 13. Watch. Stand fast in the faith. Be brave and be strong. Now when I read this scripture, most times when I read scriptures, I try to check the meaning of each of those words in the lexicon. I was shocked to find out that that word be brave eh, actually means be a man. The word be brave, let me read it to you in my lexicon. Let me read the Greek to you. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Let me read the Greek. Be brave. Brave, that word brave is the Greek word andrizomai. And it means to act manly. Are you here? What does it mean? To act manly. So he says, this is Paul now speaking to the Corinthian church. He says, watch, stand fast in the, in the faith, act manly, be strong. Okay, let's read it in a simpler translation. Give me NLT first. Okay, give me ESV. English Standard Version. Good. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like who? Be. So it means, therefore, for a Christian man, beyond your masculinity, what describes, remember what I said masculinity is, the attributes that characterize what? Manhood. Alright? So, for you to be a man, you must look like a man. Right? For you to be a man, you must have the qualities of a man. For us to call you a man. But for the Christian, it's not enough to have your masculinity. You must have deeper characteristics. And Paul is saying that one of them is that a Christian man must know how to be what? Watchful. Watchful. And what does it mean to be watchful? It means that as a Christian man, you must have control. Control over your passions and your emotions so that you do not enter into temptation. Are you with me? The Bible says that it was Jesus that said unto them, Could you not tarry with me for one hour? Watch, lest you do what? Huh? 
fall into temptation. So when he says be watchful here, he's saying that you have control over your passions, over your emotions, so that you do not enter into what? Temptation. So a real man, for men who want to know, Christian men who want to know what a real man is, a real man, a real man, huh? his passions, his appetites, his emotions, he has absolute control. So a real man does not put his hands on a woman that is not his wife. A real man. His sexual appetite, because that's another way that the world measures men. So there are all kinds of herbal products now. Eh? In fact, on social media now, social media now, there are all kinds of paid adverts on how to make you a warrior, a sexual warrior. How to make you a sexual lion. How to make you the giant of the world in sex. Because the world also measures masculinity by sexual prowess. Are you with me? But for the Christian man, his passions, his emotions, his appetites for sex, he has control over it. So he can wait until he's married. He can wait until he's married. It's not just his hands that he has control over. He has control over his eyes. So he doesn't look upon pornography. And when sisters come into his presence, he can look upon them without lust in his heart. A real man. Sure you know that in the world today, in the world today, women have been objectified. Do you know what I mean by that? The world today portrays women as objects that men can use to satisfy their longings. Are you here? So that is why if they want to advertise male products, they will use a woman that is half naked. Why? Is it the woman you are buying or the product? It's because they feel that everything that a man is doing is so that he can get a woman to satisfy his sexual cravings. So men are described as people who don't have sense. That if a man just sees a woman, he loses his head. A Christian man must be able to prove, a real man must be able to prove that he has control over his passions and his emotions. If you don't have control over your passions, you are not a real man. If you like, have muscles that we, they don't have your shirt size in the market again because your chest is too big. If you can't control your passions and your emotions, you are a weak man. You are not a real man. You ask him, why did he put his hand on a 13-year-old? He says, he's the devil. That's not a real man. That's not a real man. He said, okay, uh, uh, I don't know. I can't control my sexual urges. I can't control my desires. So since I can't control it, let me be feeding myself with pornography first. That's not a real man. That's a boy in a man's body. Real men can control their passions. Because you see, brothers, when you get married, every day is not a sex day. You will have sex holidays. There will be days in your life that there's not even appetite. If you don't know how to survive now as a single brother, you will kill your wife. 